a whole new global talk show, News Tell Us. Let's meet our panellists. The world was in mourning over the victims of the explosion in China's port city of Tianjin very recently. But soon after, we saw another tragedy in the horrendous terror attack in Bangkok, Thailand, which killed many innocent people. The story has, of course, been all over the media, including the BBC and CNN, as well as on social media. So I feel like these horrific incidents are happening with increasing regularity. These days, we saw a lot of innocent people losing their lives in Bangkok, which, unlike the Tianjin explosion, turned out to be a terrorist attack, if I'm correct. What was your reaction to this story? I think what was very striking about it to me was that Bangkok is not a place you often associate with these kind of incidents. That's true, um, yeah. We've become sort of used to this kind of news from the Middle East, in particular places like Syria and Iraq. Mm. Uh, but Bangkok is a very popular tourist uh, destination, and it's not somewhere that you associate with the kinds of groups uh, that usually commit these kind of acts. Mm. So I think it's quite shocking in that sense as well, obviously, because of the loss of life involved. Indeed. Well, we've all traveled to Bangkok, you know, plenty of times each, I would think. And mm. I think seeing an attack like this probably resonates a little bit more when it's a place that you've been. You know, you see the coverage on TV and you think, yeah. like, well, I've, I've been there and, and people who, you know, are not involved, whatever this person, this uh, terrorist, presuming it is terrorist, objective is, like the people who were harmed by this clearly had nothing to do with it. And I think mm. that's one of the really tragic things about terrorism is that it targets people who are generally not involved in whatever the person's trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been many cases like that. They, they targeted tourists, so, so they are hitting the government in a very cruel and uh, indirect way. Mm. Uh, that's the case of Bangkok, I, I guess. Uh, it seems to get worse and worse, actually. Okay, so as we mentioned, Thailand's not really a traditional target for terrorist groups. So it seems that terrorism isn't really limited to a certain country or a single type of people anymore. So our topic today is the era of international terrorism. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the news briefing section. What are the biggest terror attacks that you can think of that have happened around the world? Well, a really um, impactful one quite recently in June was uh, in Tunisia, mm -hmm. uh, in which a lone gunman uh, shot 38 people to, to death um, at a tourist resort. The majority of the victims were British. That was a very big news story mm. in the UK, Ireland kind of area. Like most people in that sort of situation, he would have been inspired by sort of this global belief in the supremacy of Islam and the mm -hmm. need to inflict violence for various political aims. Okay. And Any in other? France, I mean, two weeks ago, uh, it was huge in the news. There was a young Moroccan guy with very heavy weapons who tried to shoot at people in a train mm -hmm. between Amsterdam and a very high speed train between Amsterdam and Paris. And very luckily, he was stopped by uh, three American citizens. Mm -hmm. But because of their heroic behavior, they were able to stop the, the gunner. But he could have turned pretty bad. I mean, you can imagine the, the damage. A guy with guns, and he had a lot of guns and mm. a rifle. Well, I, I would uh, like to mention the example of uh, Russia uh, when they did the Olympics of uh, Winter Olympics of Sochi, mm -hmm. 2014. Like one month before, in December 2013, they suffered uh, two bombing attacks of terrorists. Mm -hmm. That was one example of terrorists trying to boycott some event made by the Russian government. But normally, those those groups they never get their purpose. They only kill civilians. They only kill innocent people. But finally, the Olympic Games uh, were were made and they were successful and uh, unfortunately a lot of people died for nothing. Mm. Well in 2013 there was a pretty scary bombing at the Boston Marathon which is you know a really Indeed. big public gathering and this really interesting backstory came out of it. It was carried up by these two brothers who had immigrated to the United States as kids from Chechnya. Oh and a very interesting book was just written about this by one of my favorite journalists uh, Russian-American Masha Gessen. The book is called The Brothers. And it's about their story and it's about where they came from. And it's something that a lot of people who 
carry out tourist attacks don't get is this sort of like humanizing portrait about like, you know, who are these people and where did they come from? I think a lot of people were wondering, these two kids seem like they're pretty well adjusted. Like they had a lot of friends, you know, they went to school, they seemed like very normal. So, you know, what drove them to carry out this attack? And I think we still don't know, but it, the book is an interesting background and context for terrorism. I think with a lot of terrorist attacks, we don't really get the context of like what drove these people to act in such a violent way. So these terrorists seem to target these well-populated places as well, don't they? So it's pretty, pretty horrific. Well, the US releases an annual terrorism threat assessment report that lists countries that are involved in acts of terror. They're classified as state sponsors of terrorism. And let's see what happened in Korea recently before we continue with our talk. Just a couple of weeks ago, two South Korean soldiers were maimed by mine blasts that North Korea planted in the demilitarized zone at the border. Soon after, Kim Jong-un ordered his military units to attack South Korean loudspeakers along the border, resulting in the local residents having to evacuate their homes. So I believe this is one of the reasons you guys were so busy in the past couple of weeks, uh, reporting on the border control issue. One of the soldiers had to have their foot amputated. The local civilians had to flee their neighborhoods uh, because of the North's artillery fire. What kind of stories did you write and what were your reactions to this? Well, we, we all, I guess we all wrote stories about it. We, we talked how those mines exploded there, how South Korea accused North Korea directly and then North Korea denied their implication of the but then after when they got the, when they got the, when the tensions mounted and they finally got an agreement North Korea kind of recognized that they did they they said they regretted the explosion but basically they were recognizing that mm -hmm. they were the authors of right. the mine attack North Korea very regularly has this military provocation they mm -hmm. kill or hurt South Korean citizens or soldiers but I, I don't know whether we can call it terrorism it's difficult. I mean, I know uh, Korea was on the list of states supporting terrorism, which mm -hmm. is um, slightly different. So North Korea used to be on the US list of state sponsors of terrorism. And after the Sony hacking incident last year, a lot of lawmakers were keen to put North Korea back on the list. Do you agree with this sentiment? Do you think North Korea should be relisted as a state sponsor of terrorism, um, also considering the latest attacks? I'm not sure to kind of give a Weasley answer, um, but I think the Obama administration sort of approach to North Korea has been what it calls st strategic patience, which is more or less just to sort of ignore it and hope the problem goes away. Um, from my point of view, from living here five years and working here, it sort of seems no matter what approach you take with North Korea, the status quo persists. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of the ultimate cynic on the North Korea question. I think if you engage, if you have sanctions, Nothing seems to make any difference. Uh, there is many things that North Korea is doing that would uh, support the idea of putting them back on that uh, terror list. Mm. Uh, for example, the shelling of the South Korean islands five years ago, the yeah. Chonan ship they sunk, the fact that they're selling weapons to many countries like Iran, the Sony hacking, as you mentioned. But my problem is uh, that would justify the fact that we put them back on that list, but we have to look at the, what will be the effect of such a policy. And I think that would be counterproductive. That would just antagonize North Korea even more. Mm -hmm. And what we need with North Korea now is dialogue. Well, one thing that's different about North Korea from a terrorist group is that North Korea is a sovereign country. And when it comes to what they do within their own borders, you know, they can pretty much do whatever they want. And there's nothing that really anybody can do to stop them. All we can do is sanction them which I think, I mean, I agree with Fred, is not really effective. Like, if we, if we ultimately want to change what happens in North Korea, it is better to have some kind of cooperative relationship as best as we can. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think people who run North Korea are very much resistant to change. I think they're resistant to inducements and they're resistant to punishment. I think there's very, I'm also with John in that I'm pretty cynical about it, but probably the least bad option is to have some kind of cooperation going on. The sea level thing that uh, out of the purposes that we can, we can achieve or not, uh, putting the North Korean on the list of terrorism, I would say like what North Korea did uh, to put them in the list of terrorism, I mean, if that's enough compared to other countries. For example, the Sony hacking. China is hacking everybody too. Uh, selling weapons to, uh, to other countries. A lot of countries are selling weapons to potentially dangerous countries. Mm -hmm. the United States is doing a lot of attacks everywhere. So uh, should we put uh, North Korea on that list? 
I, I don't think that there, are, there are enough reasons, but uh, I, I think it really, at this point it's really much more important to push and punish North Korea for their treatment, for their human rights uh, to their own people. It's the own North Koreans who are suffering the actions of North Korea. Mm -hmm. But the things that they do abroad are not much worse than the things that other countries do. Okay, so some varying opinions among our panel. It's, it's a very difficult situation because, mm. I mean, oh, yeah. North Korea has been described as a child um, by a lot of the press. Um, so it remains to be seen what will happen. And hopefully North Korea can put their own citizens first um, rather than causing trouble elsewhere. <laughs> hopefully. The September 11th attacks were a series of four coordinated terrorist attacks by the Islamic terrorist group Al-Qaeda on symbolic US landmarks including the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in 2001. The US responded to the attacks by launching the War on Terror which started a new international military paradigm against organizations designated terrorists. So one of the biggest and deadliest terror attacks uh, that I think our generation remembers. And um, people say that terrorism was actually redefined by the 9-11 attacks. So can we talk about the changes or any reinforcements in terrorism prevention measures uh, that have emerged since 9-11? Well, I think 9-11 really fundamentally changed the whole Western and probably global approach to the question of terrorism. Mm. I mean, that event spawned a huge increase in security spending and military spending. Uh, it, it spawned various, you know, wars. Um, so I think it just redefined how pressing a question it is. I think before that, there was not the same political will or interest in averting those kind of disasters because I don't think people really felt they were a big risk and since then I think it's become such a more pressing concern mm -hmm. and it's really influenced how governments and the public feel the, go the, the state should, should address violence and the, the risk of violence. Okay. One sad legacy of 9-11 is just all of the changes to daily life that come from it and all of the limitations that have been put on civil rights. Like, there's been a lot of monitoring and surveillance of not only US citizens, but people abroad. And I mean, you know, anybody who's been on a plane in the past 15 years will tell you that airports are really stiff, really scary kinds of places to be. Mm. And, you know, the legacy of 9-11 is that, you know, there's this horrific attack and then policymakers respond to the public's emotion by doing all kinds of things that you know are supposedly to make us safer but you know their more immediate legacy is just to make daily life a lot more unpleasant another consequence of the 9/11 is uh, it's been, it's been a, a big wave that is for of violence violence uh, terrorist violence first and also state violence because the united states they they answered to the 9/11 with, uh, with two wars, and they created more hate to the Western powers or to the Western civilization among Islamic countries. So um, uh, since the 9-11, uh, there are like thousands of new terrorists that they would be willing to kill us all, maybe. And, and there is something I really want to insist is that Western countries are not the main victim of terrorism. The main victim okay. of terrorism are the people in uh, usually like, uh, in, for example, Middle East. Uh, in Iraq, just in July, according to the United Nations, 1,300 people were killed in a month because of terrorist attack and right. violence. I mean, that's more, than, uh, that's more than all the, the attack in France for the last uh, century. Mm -hmm. So the main victims these days of terrorism are actually, of, especially like religious driven terrorism, mm -hmm. are Muslims themselves. Okay, so it seems like we're still feeling the after effects oh, yeah. of 9-11. Yeah, yeah. It's a once in a generation day. event. I yeah, mean, well, let's hope so. <laughs> indeed, yeah. There's still this kind of downward spiral of violence, which is infiltrating into our everyday lives as well as you know, the lives of those in the Middle East, those who are smack bang in the middle of the warfare. All right, can you guys share some stories about some of the deadliest terror groups? Well, ISIS is a particularly deadly group. Mm -hmm. um, they've carried out some really horrific acts throughout large parts of Syria and Iraq. And one thing that I guess it makes ISIS a little bit different is that they're not a group that's operating in other 
countries, they kind of consider themselves, you know, their name is the Islam Islamic State. So mm -hmm. they've they've put together, you know, a de facto country. Right. And they control a lot of people's lives and they're forcing the people who live there to live under these really strict interpretation of Islam. New York Times reporter Rukmina Kalamachi has done some extraordinary work uh, on the group reporting from Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. And she did one story recently that was particularly horrifying about, it was called ISIS's Theology of Rape. It was about mm. how ISIS has incorporated sexual violence into its way of administering its territory and it has committed really horrible acts to women and girls and in carrying out these uh, acts of sexual violence they have argued that their interpretation of Islamic scripture not only condones their sexual violence but encourages it and that these are you know sort of a divine acts that they're carrying out against members of a minority and very very scary stuff. Very twisted view indeed. In Ireland the main sort of um, group that would be known for political violence would be the IRA and its various splinter groups of which there are many and actually this issue has just come into the news again um, because earlier this month there was a murder in Northern Ireland which the police suspect has some link to former members of the provisional IRA which was the most prolific um, of the groups. I mean the provisional IRA which is just one of the many groups uh, took about 1800 lives altogether so there were in a small country like Ireland or Northern mm. Ireland, it was a very, very significant toll indeed. indeed. We can talk also about the, this really, really scary group, the Taliban. Mm. They were born in Pakistan in the early 90s after the Soviet Union retirement of Afghanistan. And they operate in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And they do like really crazy terrorist attacks. They were behind the 9-11s too. Taliban means uh, basically like uh, religious students and they have that tight interpretation of the Quran and the, and the Islam and they, they basically hate everyone that, is, that doesn't think like them and doesn't interpret it like the Sunni Islam as they do. Yeah, and there is um, this year in the news, there was this, um, I don't know if you remember, this horrendous attack in Kenya in a university where 147 students were killed. Mm. And this attack was uh, carried out by a group named Al Shebab. It's an Islamist group based in Somalia. They want to impose a Sharia law to their country and they start to uh, carry out a terror attack in the neighbor countries. And this group is still, uh, I mean, is growing and is a growing issue mm -hmm. in the in West Africa these days. Okay, um, I think most of the groups we've talked about they're mostly made up of men, but you also have the Black Widows, which were a bit of a threat to the 2014 Sochi Olympics, um, as I mentioned earlier, and they are a residual from the Chechen Wars in the 90s. There are a couple of incidents where these widows of victims who had been tortured and executed during those wars. They planted suicide bombs on themselves and blew themselves up. So that was a big threat. Um, and it's a case where the victims, I think, became the victimizers as well. So that was a really interesting case as well. We've covered various news stories on terrorism and the new aspects of it in the modern world. So let's find out how we can deal with the unpredictability of terror attacks. What Google is trying to do is amplify the voices of these terrorists who have left. It's absolutely critical that we that find individuals who are courageous enough to say, this is the mistake I made. This is what I've learned about how I can help others either not join or leave. They have been talking to the terrorists who are hanging out in chat rooms. And they are talking directly to them on the internet. This is another way that we might be able to disengage terrorists or try to get them before they jump in, help them find an identity that's different from what they find within the movement. We just heard from the world's foremost terrorism expert, Jessica Stern, who analyzed one of the biggest terrorist groups in the world in her book, ISIS, the State of Terror. And she has traveled to various countries to talk directly to terrorists and write about how to deal with future terrorism.
So it seems to be a case of keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Um, what did you think of her talk? I think she's right. I mean, if you want to fight terrorism, then you need to focus on the human factor. Mm. The way that now US is fighting terrorism with drones, bombing markets from above and uh, killing one terrorist and uh, encouraging 10 to become terrorists is mm -hmm. really not working. So I think this kind of uh, ideas seems good to me. I think okay. you, there's two uh, prongs to this. I mean, I don't think war should ever be entered into lightly, but there will always be people who can't be negotiated with and who need to be stopped and who don't seem to be able to deal in any other language except for violence. But I also think you need to be able to tackle the, the ideology and the ideas. You know, if the ideology is so powerful and so popular, no matter how many people you kill, you know, more people will take their place. And so how you do that, I think, is a very interesting and, and vital question. If you look at ISIS, what is so amazing about them, to me at least, is that they've been able to convince middle class, lucky people in Sydney or Paris or Rome or London to travel to some of the most inhospitable places mm -hmm. on the planet and give their lives for an absolutely insane cause. And I think that's fascinating. And I think we need to be able to find out why that is and we need to be able to offer an alternative because it's frankly shocking that people would find this attractive in the first place. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think as people, we, ha we all have a strong yearning to live lives that we think are meaningful and to be a part of something that is bigger than just our own lives. And in a really perverse sense, that is what terrorist mm. groups mm -hmm. offer people. You know, yeah. They offer people a kind of divine mission. You know, they tell people, you, know, you will be a part of this thing that is carrying out God's work or is, is otherwise very meaningful. So I think you know it's it's kind of abstract, but the the best way to prevent terrorism is to invest in having cohesive societies where you know people have strong institutions and like strong education and strong families and give people something to belong to that is not you know violent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we we should uh, provide all the means for for education in those in those countries. There are a lot of people that they born. They are born poor and uh, they have a poor education or, or only religious education that uh, puts them in really extreme positions. And even in, in, in Western countries, we have those, those people, they go to some special uh, places to, to uh, uh, learn that religious education. And uh, so we uh, maybe can make laws to at, le at least, uh, of course we are not gonna uh, ban religions, but we, uh, we should not encourage people to get in, in, into those kind of uh, religious education systems. And we, we have to make sure that, uh, that every children have a healthy mind based on, on science. I mean, now in France, uh, after the Charlie Hebdo killings, uh, France is trying to come up with uh, innovative measures to prevent homegrown terrorism mm -hmm. and to prevent as well young people to go to Syria. Yeah. Actually, a lot of fighters in Syria are coming from France. And they came up with some surveillance measures that I really strongly disagree. But on the other side, uh, they try to give parents some tools to detect uh, any signs among their children to see that their children show some signs of radicalization. Okay. And um, if parents are worried that their, their, their children might join a terrorist group, that they can make, a, they can, there is a phone call, they can receive some psychological help. Uh, there is all uh, a full box of tools trying to stop these children from being too radicalized. And uh, this is just the beginning, but mm -hmm. I think it's a good, it's, it's a good preventive measures and uh, I hope it will be efficient. So terrorism is always going to be difficult to eradicate, uh, but I think it's down to society um, and individual families as well to combat extremism and offer a better alternative to it, as we said. All right, so let's wrap up with our final headlines. Uh, Fred, can you start us off this week? Um, I would say terrorism, more violence is not the answer. Great stuff. Steven? I was going to say something similar. I was um, going to say terrorism okay. shows us that violence only begets violence. Mm -hmm. I would say that we decide how we react to terrorism. Okay. We are news tellers. You are with us or you are with the terrorist. <laughs> Just a little bit of sense of humor for an for a issue that is very sad. But. It's a very Atta-esque headline. <laughs> Thank you so much for your insights on a very serious uh, but needs to be discussed topic. I um, hope you enjoyed yourselves. Of course, thank you. I'll see you guys next week. And viewers, join us next week for a whole new global talk show. Please tell us.
We will be open for any opinions or requests on our official website as well as our Facebook page. Boko Haram, which operates in northern Nigeria, they kidnapped a, a whole bunch of girls from the school. And the way that they explained it was like, you know, protecting them from this, uh, you know, corrupting influence of Western education. Death doesn't seem to matter so much. If you're Muslim, then it's okay somehow to kill or rape the people who are not. Some guy would look at another guy's wife and all and mm. so he'd shoot him. And then someone would shoot the other guy as, as revenge. When you put guns in the hands of, you know, unstable sociopaths, that these kind of things are inevitable.